have two degrees. One's in fine arts and one's in landscape architecture here from the uh, University of Oregon. And I started up a business that uh, designed homes and landscapes and ecological planning that was running for 13 years. So I've been designing landscapes for, oh dear, um, I guess it's sustainable landscapes for almost 18 years now maybe. Um, lots of uh, examples around the city of Eugene. And, uh, and then I also teach uh, within two water programs at LCC. I teach in the Water Conservation Technician Program. I'm the principal instructor there. And I teach in the Watershed Science Technician Program, which is a brand new uh, program. It's uh, fun. And I, I got to help uh, design that, that whole program. So here we go. Um, I guess we could talk a little bit about the picture we're seeing here. We're going to dive into that a little bit more. But uh, this is in the project here uh, in Eugene before the stormwater best management practices were a requirement here in uh, Eugene. So that was fun getting that permitted. <coughs> it's also the first permitted green residential green roof here in Eugene. So um, we got to know the city really well during that process. We'll get into that more. <laughs> So being a teacher in the Water Conservation Technician Program, I can't move forward um, without telling, give you some, giving you some background as to why should we be doing some rainwater harvesting. Uh, I love this graphic. Um, these bubbles, these blue bubbles, are representing, consider them three-dimensional, representing the mass of water that we have available here on Earth. The biggest bubble is representing all water. So I know when we think of oceans, we think, oh, the earth is two-thirds water. It's just a skin, really. Um, th they're not very deep when you consider the whole mass of earth. So that's the caveat there. The smaller, much, much smaller bubble there, that is all the fresh water that's available. And that's, it takes a lot of work to be able to make salt water drinkable, potable. The teeny tiny bubble that just looks like a mistake there above Florida, that's the available fresh water, not locked up in glaciers. Much as we love our glaciers, um, they're not available for us to drink. Um, and there's other caveats, like the, there's water that's actually locked up in rocks, not just aquifers, but it's intrinsic in our geology that we can't get access to. So that little tiny blip is the fresh water that's available for the entire Earth. Okay. I like this. Uh, so that might be telling as to why it is that we should be saving water. But now we're conserving water. Why would we want to conserve water? PA says, the issue of water conservation is not about saving water. It's about having enough clean water at any given time and place to meet our needs. And I like that specifically for here in the Pacific Northwest where people say, well, we've got water all the time. What's the problem? Well, we don't. We, ha we basically have a drought throughout the entire summer. This year, I believe it was four months. It's usually a three-month drought. And that could be extending with global climate change or whatever is happening to the earth, um, that window can uh, enlarge or small uh, or shrink, we don't know. Um, so just a, so although the Mackenzie always provide, that's where we get our water, right? So the Mackenzie always provides us with water because of this amazing geology that we have that I won't get into. Uh, but if, should we continue to pull water, that doesn't always allow for the critters in, in, within our creeks and beside the creeks that use them and whatnot. So moving on to why harvest rainwater specifically. Environmental benefits of rainwater catchment were reducing the negative impacts on natural waterways through reducing, reducing urban stormwater impacts, reducing the drawdown of municipal water, and that's something I just talked about to make that connection back either for river or groundwater. It recharges groundwater supplies should you have an overflow that allows for that, and we'll talk more about that. It can be a source of cleaner water than provided by local municipal municipality. That's not really our case here necessarily, unless you're concerned about chlorine. 
and there could be a spill in the river, you never know. Um, so things could happen. And then of course we've got chlorine-free irrigation water. So this water here, I'm not sure how well you can see it, this is water running along a gutter and going into a catch basin. This water is actually considered some of our small blip water. This is our clean, fresh, available water. <laughs> Does anybody know where the water goes around here once it goes into this catch basins? Right from the dirty curb to the river. Yep. This graph here represents two watersheds. People know what watersheds are in this room? See a lot of nods. Two watersheds that are of similar size. One is still natural vegetation cover. One is urbanized. Both have similar size creeks that run through them. This graph represents what happens to those creeks in a rainfall. So in an urbanized setting, the water runs off of our fast roofs, off of our concrete, quickly into pipes, pipes, bigger pipes, bigger pipes into the river. So we get this spike of all the water hits the creek at the same time. Boom. So that means that we've got a dirty river. We, we've probably got erosion happening, cutting off the sides. So it really impacts the health of our rivers by moving that water so quickly so we don't uh, have to drive through puddles and whatnot. Uh, the way that our system's set up now. Here in a more natural setting, the, the trees intercept the water. It takes a long time for that water to get down to the to the surface and then running through the soil layers as well. So we have a less impact on the stream and then the stream actually stays higher for longer as the water still seeps through. Okay, so now we know why we want to collect rainwater. Um, before you get too far, I think the first thing that you should do is understand your regulations so you know what you can do and what's gonna be required of you. So here in Eugene and, and Springfield, the use of rainwater is allowed outdoors without a permit if your tank is less than 5,000 gallons. It's approximately six feet by six feet by six feet. That's a 5,000 gallon rain tank. So that's each 5,000 gallon tank. If you have less than, you can have one over here, one over there, one over here. That's right. Less than you may need an electrical permit if you're going to have a pump associated with your tank. Um, especially if it's going to be um, wired in line, not just plugged into an outlet. Of course, if you don't have an outlet outdoors to use for your pump, you'll need an electrical permit for that as well. So just some images of what could rainwater harvesting look like. Uh, I think a lot of people picture these little barrels, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. This one in the upper right hand, your left hand corner, uh, is a tank that's typically buried and you just have access to the top port. These are some slim inline tanks, and here's a side view of a slightly different version of these tanks. Some people often don't have room for tanks, so you can just line them all the way up along your fence and actually get <coughs> a few gallons out of that, no, worthy gallons. I thought this was a sweet little um, system <coughs> you could have an, as an aesthetic component. This is beautiful too, but it also looks quite functional to me. A uh, stone tank. Um, and this is a pillow tank. You can have those underneath, uh, of course, in basements or crawl spaces, but you can also have them under decks and whatnot. Um, they're What's the fabric they're made out of? I believe it's a... Um, <coughs> no, there, there's different kinds. Yeah, some are PVC and some are... are um, uh, approved for potable. So will that picture be available on? Internet? I think that you're going to make the whole slideshow available. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> sure. Yeah, and um, I put the links for every every image that's not mine. I have a link to get to them. Do you know what the dimensions are on the slim one? Well, they're d they're different ones. Um, I just installed a series with a with my students actually. Um, that are, let's see, I think they're five inches when they're not filled with water and they expand to seven inches. And they were a little bit taller than I am and about my width. So <laughs> that's, that's how I, each one of those held 75 gallons. And so you, you could connect them up in line. The smaller ones they showed here, these are 50 gallons and these are 75. 
and you see these pipes are running all wildly. It's, they're not, they're designed by somebody who doesn't quite understand rainwater harvesting. So we had to do some interesting things with our pipes. The tank is designed by somebody who doesn't quite get it. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can't change the inlets and outlets yeah. as well as you can with these typical large HDPE type tanks that I have some images of here as well. So you can get fun and whimsical with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to share that we're all thinking broadly about our tanks and tank options. This is uh, the same project that was on the very front uh, image. These are our drawings that we used. So the idea here is that we were managing all of the post-development stormwater on site. And it really came about because the site was just below the stormwater system. So we would have had to pump the water out endlessly forever. So um, this is a green roof that accepts the water from all of this hardscaped roof. That roof is our filter. So it, th there's actually less water coming through because we have a lot of evapotranspiration happening with the green roof. And then the, micro, uh, the biology happening within the soils and around the roots of the plants cleans the water. So this is our filter before it goes into this tank. This was done in cooperation with the city of Eugene for three years post, what was it, five years? Oh dear, three to five years. Um, they did uh, wa testing of the water in our tank to make sure there wasn't E. coli or other um, bacteria in there and it was clean. So uh, our overflow in this case, because this is a 700 gallon tank, much, much more water comes off of this roof than that. So our overflow then goes into a swale, a detention pond, another swale, dry well, and then this is taking, in case there's overflow from this hardscape roof, now we've got a swale coming back this way. And this is, if people want to look at things laterally. Is a dry well in this case? A dry well is um, actually these days frowned upon. Um, you have to get a little bit. Uh, you have to get a permit from the DEQ to have a dry well. So what they are is they are basically a hole in the ground that it may have a void in there, it, or it may be filled with round rocks. So there's spaces in between there, and it's a place for the water to be and then slowly percolate down or out. Um, in this case, actually, the water came up out of our dry well. That's for another story. <laughs> yeah, if you want to be directly in the gardens or something like that, then you want to have a holding space so you can direct the gardens. Which is where a cistern comes in. Right. Yeah, either above or below ground. We could have put another cistern in below ground. Actually, the, the water is so saturated here in the winter that a, a cistern would, you'd have to take a lot of measures for the cistern not to float. <laughs> and there's a lot of spaces like that in Eugene. <laughs> They're considered direct injection, meaning that you could get a contaminant down into the groundwater, where there, it's really hard to clean up. Yeah. If you're so gonna be, if you're gonna be drinking rainwater, do you need to uh, treat it? Technically, yes, you do. Um, both with filtration, so taking it down to a 0.5 microns, and then they want um, some sort of sterilization. So that's either UV or chlorine to bring it indoors and drink it, or to drink it anyway. Or to shower, you don't. Um, I mean, you, you do because it, it um, yeah. comes into droplets and you can intake yeah. it, okay. either even just through breathing. And they don't take, any, I promise not to breathe water. or and keep my mouth yeah. shut in the shower, it doesn't work. <laughs> so do I have to be concerned about my asphalt roof if I'm going to be using this as irrigation? Not in, I don't think so, because uh, my understanding is that the toxic um, components of an asphalt roof come from if the water is sitting on that roof. It doesn't. It runs right off. So what you get are a lot of the little sand particles or yeah. the grit off okay. of that roof, and that's where filtration comes in. Gotcha. Um, and it can be, we'll get to the other filtration. It doesn't have to be those little micron filters. It can be a little more open than that. So here's a actual pictures of that project, and just so you can get a, a feeling for what, uh, how you can incorporate stormwater <coughs> features into your landscape in, a, in an aesthetic way. Right, so it doesn't look like a leftover thought 
or what have you. So we're actually looking at the, the detention pond here when it's dry. And this is a retaining wall that runs through the site. And its overflow is, goes through a notch in that retaining wall. This is a 700 gallon tank. In this case, this is a, a second manhole. So it didn't meet their specifications. And so we got it for pretty cheap. Um, but as you can see, we had to crane it in, which was quite a project. And we did use their manhole cover, and we got a friend to change that top so that it's a very fine screen. Sir, what kind of soil is on that property? Clay. <laughs> <laughs> so we brought in, in this upper terrace, we brought in a lot of, um, I, I consider it juicy soil, uh, more organic soil some that can absorb the the water. I forgot to mention that's another workshop that we're you've been toying with is um, about healthy soil because it's so mm. important and a lot of folks don't think about it. So um, I don't think I put that on our evaluation as one of the options, but if that's something you're interested in, we're just wondering how many people would show up to a workshop on soil. But if that interests you, please let us know because we'd like to do that. As a, I don't know if this is a cherry or not, but soils are fascinating and. <laughs> Almost all of the life, I mean, more life than you can imagine is in that soil. It's, it's astounding what's going on down there. You will not, <laughs> you just will, you won't have a healthy landscape if you don't have healthy soils or if, and or if you don't match the appropriate plants to whatever soil you have. You have to know what's going on there. So you can have clay soils because we have clay here in the Willamette Valley, right? And we have plenty of wetland plants and you can um, play with those in an artistic way and still have a, a good wildlife value, high wildlife value. This is another project I did. These are not all my projects, um, I, but this, these two are. <laughs> um, this is uh, two inline tanks, and this is the HDPE. Actually, these are HDLPE tanks. It's just a type of plastic that doesn't leach, very sturdy. Um, in this case, the tanks can be buried up to two-thirds of the height of their tanks. So you, that's more specifications you need to know about your tanks to know what you can do with them. Um, so there are two inline tanks, which means that there's 10,600 gallons off of this um, tank. And we could fill those tanks up from just a quarter of the roof of the garage, just to give you a feeling for how much water we have here in a typical metal, year. A it does. This one's a metal roof. And I have some more images later, um, actually they're drawings, to show you more about how this system is put together just so you can start making the connections to a system that you might want. Is that like one of those suburban six-car garages or something? It's, no, it's not. It's a, it's a two-car garage. It's actually very small. The numbers that are floating around, I almost feel like I need this, how much volume of water you get off the roof sooner rather than later. Cause, okay. Because I'm in that 55-gallon drum mindset. and You will water a tomato plant for a whole week. Right. Yeah. And, and that's it. <laughs> You're done for the year. <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll be getting to that. Um, Maybe the houses should actually be filled with. And I have a picture of that next. <laughs> Excellent. And this is this also was designed with cisterns in mind. This is on Third and Lawrence. Um, Solark wasn't the initial designers, but they did pick it up and they did the design and engineering on this project. This is on the corner of Third and Mill. Mill. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So when you drive by, you can see this tank on the outside here. It, there's a courtyard inside the building that you can see here, and there's another a second tank inside, and they are connected. And in this case, they do use the water for irrigation, but they also use the water indoors for um, laundry and um, toilet flushing. <coughs> now, when you do use a um, anything that's metal but not like corten steel or stainless steel, you have the potential for rusting out, right? So. You can see just a little, if you look very hard, when you get there, that just looks like a shadow, right? But there's a rubber liner inside of these tanks, also known as a bladder. And um, you almost always have to have them designed specifically for your tank. There is a fairly local, um, depends on how you define local. They used to be in Bend, now they're just outside of Bend. 
uh, and they will create these and, and they'll even um, install them for you. So, we. It's bend and tarp. Yeah. What's it called again? Bend and tarp. Oh, bend? Like it's either bend or bend and tarp. I'm not sure which. Google both. Maybe we can include a link as we send out follow-up info. Sure. And this is Anita Van Aspert, who's also a local landscape architect, and her husband's home. They designed this together, and it is, uh, this is their cistern. It's integrated into their home here. So, and the water falls off of this roof and onto these rocks and into this grate. And then they collect the water that might be flowing along their um, patio here as well, and it gets into that. I don't know all of the ins and outs. I don't know how they clean out the grates. I'm sure that they were clever enough to figure something out that I just can't see on the surface. And this is just the first rainwater harvesting system that was permitted and approved up in Portland. And that was back in 1996. For potable. For potable, thank you, yeah, a potable. Uh, what, one of those. <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, I, I, these numbers, my understanding is they did have to, um, they didn't have everything quite right in there and they did have to spend a little bit more money and do some redo there. So how to calculate how much water you need. There's a couple of different tools to do that by um, the EPA's interactive water budget tool has you, um, actually let me skip here. So you gather the square footage of your entire yard and then to break that out into how much square footage is of your plants have high water needs, how much medium, low, and no, um, because they do ask for your um, driveway areas and those sorts of things that don't need to be watered. Um, so if you do a little bit of homework there, then you can go right to the EPA interactive water budget tool and plug in the numbers. Is that gross square footage or net square footage? So are you subtracting the, the building? Subtracting the building. That's Thank you. Net square footage. Net square footage. Period of time. Yes. Thank you. So any Good clarification. Water, yeah. Right. Well, but it's it's really be. your outdoor space because they do have you plug in, uh, and you you could just subtract those numbers and say you don't have anything. Uh, you know, it, it's not. So it walks you through subtract your per impervious surface you don't want to be watering. In this case, you actually add it in, and then they don't include it. It's, it depends on how much you've put in initially for your full square footage, so you can either put it in or not. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. And then our other um, one option, and th this, is, this can be challenging for people, but we do have uh, eWeb's green gauge guide as an option, uh, and it'll tell you how much water in inches, square inches, you need to water to keep your lawn green. And you have the whole history of it, so you can add it up and figure out how much you might need to keep a grassy area green over the summer. So you can calculate that and, and apply that to your space. Keep in mind that their green gas gauge guide that's uh, measuring ev evapotranspiration, and then you're replacing it, that guide, or their measuring tool, is in a fairly narrow strip in the urban setting next to a parking lot. So it has a lot of heat that's associated with it. And so it'll have a higher evapotranspiration rate. And then of course, grass uses a significant amount of water. So just keep those things in mind when you're using the green gas ga gauge as a guide. It's for extreme conditions. Now we're finally at rainwater collection potential. Um, there's several different ways to think about these calculations and things that can be manipulated here. So a very quick way to think about it here is, is demonstrated on the bottom. An inch of rain falling on a thousand square foot house gets you 500 gallons. That is due to some loss, things bouncing off of the top of your roof, um, some leaks maybe in your uh, gutter system, and the first flush that we'll talk about in a little bit here. Walking through the numbers here, area is your 
square foot, your roof area in square feet. Point eight, that efficiency coefficient, that's what I was just talking about. If you have an asphalt roof, you're going to lose more water and it's going to get there just a little bit more slowly than if you have a metal roof, which would be a 0.9 coefficient because it's moving faster, right? And you're losing less because it's not as bumpy. Tile roofs, um, about a 0.7, say like a flat lawn, pretending you're calculating how much you can gather off of that, that's say 0.1 or even a 0.5 coefficient, just so you can start thinking about that. If you have wood shingles, I don't recommend collecting water because the wood shingles tend to have fungicides in them, maybe even some herbicides in them, fire retardants, don't go there. So what about metal? Is there contaminants that you have to worry about there? I mean, is there a preferable material in terms of the purity of the water? There is, there are metal roofs that are um, specifically for potable water systems. Since we're using the water outdoors, um, it's generally not considered much of an issue. Some people consider it an issue to be, to be collecting off of an asphalt roof, too. Yeah. I, since there's so many people who have asphalt roofs, the water's not sitting on the roof, I tend to think it's okay. Yeah. Oh. If you were to get a permit from the, from the city, and the, the city, by way of state regulation, would say, don't collect it from your asphalt roof, right? And they would For potable. Metal? Oh, for Metal? potable? Is that what you're... No, I mean, I think... Oh, you just across the board, that's what you guys recommend? Would say you should have, you know... <coughs> a metal, metal roof? Or, but... I just have to say that. Yeah, please. <laughs> well, metal, metal roofing really was really cheap about um, 15 years ago, and now it's very expensive. Very expensive, uh, yep. So people yeah. can afford it, so that's why they do asphalt roofing or yep. something right. else. Right. <coughs> I think the key is, and I, when I clean out my gutters and I have asphalt roofs, it's, you know, it's all that, that Grit. Stuff, right? So you just need to make sure that you're filtering that out like you mentioned earlier. Yep. We'll get into how you do that. <laughs> okay. So in this um, calculation here, uh, the number that's been plugged in is the average monthly rainfall in Eugene. Whether or not that is a useful number could be questionable, um, but you might want to know just in average, how much can I calculate over the, over the whole year? You might want to plug in the full amount of water that we get through the year. Or maybe you just want to know how much it actually gathers in the summer. So there's some numbers here that, that help us with that information. So I like to plug in 42 here to tell me how much water I can get over the whole year. So I see your data. Did it stop at 2006? Yes, this is old data. Mm -hmm. So where can we get recent data? So we can really see Do you know where we can get recent data? I can send, I think that there's a website that can, I'll make sure to send that out in our follow-up. I think we've actually been getting drier. Yeah. So, so we would reduce that number. Interesting. Although I also heard that we're, we've caught up on our rainfall already for the year, so, so we're, above. we're actually above now. Yeah. So I think that our, our drought time is extending, but the rainfall that we get over the year is still staying the same, if not even going up. It's very interesting. Actually, I mean, just, is anybody collecting data on uh, the changes associated with uh, global climate change? I'm sure somebody is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, just for the Northwest. I mean, that's what we're trying to. Isn't that what we're all looking at? Is how, how some type of projection or imagination as to how things might change? Mm -hmm. So I keep hearing that in 50 years we're going to have the climate of Sacramento, California. Yeah, that's another presentation. The total amount of rain for the year is one thing, but it's sort of like how much rain can I catch in July and August, catching micro rain to like top up the tank. To, you're right. It's like, yeah, I can collect gazillions in the winter, but then okay, my tank's going down, down, down. Yeah, right. what happens if What's my micro rain catchment to get me through certain... Right. So, so this talk is focusing on using your, our water outdoors. Um, because we catch such copious amounts of rain, way more than is um, reasonable to have tanks on our sites, um, that's where you might consider bringing the water indoors to use year-round. However, um, it's usually f fairly expensive to, to go back and double pipe 
for rainwater and, and our city water. But if you're doing a remodel or any new construction, you might want to consider double piping so that you can capture and use much of that water that you're capturing throughout the year. So if folks are interested in that, maybe show the hands, how many people are, are more interested in using rainwater for flushing toilets and, and drinking? So we could have a, you know, a specific workshop on that. A lot of what I think we hear from people is wanting to use it for rainwater because um, they're not planning on doing any re renovations to their house, and it's something you could do relatively easily. Right. And that's, um, you know, in terms of using rainwater indoor use in this climate, it makes mm -hmm. makes a lot more sense. So uh, I think that'd be a great topic for a future workshop, and really yeah. get into the nitty gritty of how do you set up your system and make sure that it's um, clean enough to use for the use you want. Yep. Okay, so. Um, Briefly, the color of your tank matters. It's been shown that a white tank in the sun has cooler water than a black tank in the shade. Why does cooler matter? Why do you want your water cooler? Bacterial growth. Bacterial growth um, assuming that light can get in, you can get some plant growth. And then what happens then is it deoxygenates. So it's not as high a quality of water. So want to keep your water, your tank is as light as possible. Here he's got a black tank, but he's um, lightening it up just through oranges and, uh, and beautifying it too. So shading your tank is important. Even if you do have that white tank, if you can get it shaded, that's fabulous. You can do it through planting, uh, have a vine. Maybe you're lucky enough to have a tree. Tuck it in on the north side of your building. Um, and then this is a beautiful cedar covering. Should we all be so lucky to? Because you don't want to, you don't want a tank that's kind of translucent because you can get a lot of algae growth. Voila! <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, this tank is going to require a lot more maintenance than one that is in the shade. You're going to have to. Um, you can't even get into this tank. So you're going to have to do something like a bleach. How are you going to get all that stuff off of there? So that's something to consider when you're picking a tank that I don't have a picture for. I'll, like, well, I'll use this one. Um, <laughs> how are you going to maintain it? It is good to get in there occasionally and really wipe it out. You might have collected gunk in the bottom should there have been some unfortunate thing that happened through the process. Um, so. That's another reason to get either larger. I can't really recommend smaller, as we've talked about with a 55-gallon drum waters a tomato plant for a week in the summer. So you have all this money into the piping and the overflow and the, um, the first flush and all of this, and then you've got a tank that's undersized. So that you really, if you just spend more money on that tank, you're going to get a lot more use out of it. Now, uh, granted, you're losing space, too. That's why I showed you some slim line so tanks as well. What's, what's wrong with having algae in water that you're using to water a garden? It's still going to deoxygenate the, the water. And, and so what's wrong with that? What's, where's, the, where's the pinch point? What's the problem? Water is H2O, and so if you're losing some of that O, it's, it's not um, as, as beneficial as it could be for the plants. So... That's my knowledge. You guys know more about it than I do. Well, what is? Might change the pH of the water. Could change the pH. Um, but the algae and the and the bacterial ooze that might be in that tank could also uh, filter the water. Mm -hmm. It can. They have shown that the bacteria that's growing on the sides of tanks uh, is filled with, or can be filled with, um, heavy metals. So it's pulling heavy metals out of the water. <laughs> Um, so okay. Do a little research and follow up on that because that, that's the conventional wisdom is make sure you're not growing anything in your tank. Yeah. But huh? Who, maybe conventional wisdom we can set it on its little rump. Well, we don't know. Couldn't the algae also be providing nutrients to a garden? Potentially. Yeah. But maybe not the ones you want. <laughs> <laughs> it is. So anyway, but we will follow up and see if we can get a handle on that. Yeah. Good okay. question. So how are you cleaning out the slimline tank? Yeah. <laughs> not. Yeah. You know, they're thing. not opaque. They're not opaque. I mean, they are opaque. They're, they're, they're oh, thank you. Right. Yeah. They are opaque. Yeah. yeah. But 
uh, even those tanks. Uh, they need very little maintenance. Um, I tend to recommend to stick your head in once a year, but um, people who have been using those tanks, they've been in for more than five years and haven't needed to do anything. Um, so they, the tanks themselves are low maintenance. You might have some more maintenance um, with the pipes that are coming through. You know, the, they may come loose, and, and that's a pretty easy fix. Um, <clears throat> much easier bladders. than getting inside of your tanks. Right. What do they have? If, well, if they have bladders, the ones that have bladders, can you, or I don't know if the small ones, do, can you not pull those out and kind of rinse them out? Because yeah. Mm -hmm. But then what do you do with that water? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> ah. So there's two basic kinds of systems in rainwater harvesting. Um, this is a wet system. Uh, the place that we're collecting from is farther away, and what we know is that it's taller than this inlet pipe. <laughs> And so water stays in the pipe from where it's gone. It's, it's gone more likely than not against the house, down, underground, to over here, up, and in. So this water is going to always be in these pipes. What you're going to want to do in this type of system, and there's a lot of reasons to do this. One is um, your tank can be really anywhere in the landscape. It doesn't have to be adjacent to the house because we just have gravity and pressure. It's pulling the water down over and up, as long as this up is not higher than our down. Right? So in the summer, you're going to want to have a way to uh, drain these pipes. So again, it's not another mosquito issue. Then you have the dry system. Water goes from A to B, and it doesn't stay in this pipe at all. Oop, that's a dry system. So what about freezing in the wet system? That's another reason to, um, well, no, because it's buried. it's buried, so you want to at least have two feet coverage. And I haven't had problems with the tank the the systems. Be because the water's moving through it pretty quickly, I just, I haven't had problems with it. Mm -hmm. um, that wouldn't be a bad precaution to take, would be to insulate it, sure, but I, I haven't had problems. You know, in all of our downspouts, they're not insulated, and water run, runs through them pretty, pretty quickly. Um, no, so. But yeah, we're talking about the water staying in that pipe. Mm -hmm. So I just I haven't had a problem yet. And, and it's in an upper, higher elevation. Oh, sorry, at least the, the tank that I'm thinking of, uh, the tank system out in Marcola uh, at a high elevation. And they haven't had freezing. They've had more trouble with it getting too hot and the connections coming apart mm -hmm. because they didn't shade it as I designed. <laughs> I mean, can so. you use it also as a solar gain if you use dark tanks? You know, I mean, light tanks are better. You could use it as solar gain and storage for the ha you know, just for heating it, radiating into a house as well. Oh, yeah, sure. That's a, that's a, um, a well-known, so or it's kind of a 70s version of, of passive solar homes right. when they first came out. That was definitely a strategy. And I've also seen um, black piping used to uh, trellis over a hot tub, and that's the water's running through there, warming up, and then it comes into the hot tub. So yeah, there's plenty of ways to play with that. So the system components, in a nutshell, we've got a leaf screen, a first flush conveyance, how are we getting the water from A to B, um, and then within the cistern itself, you've got water coming in. The water that, uh, a place for the water to, uh, let's say you've got a spigot or it's connected to a pump in your irrigation system, water is exiting the, the tank, getting it to where you want it to go, but then you also have an overflow for when your tank is too full. Uh, you need a clean out access and you have a foundation. The foundation is very important, what's happening underneath the cistern itself. Oh, and I pitted overflow again. I'm really serious about that overflow. Um, I think what I mean there is something like a, a swale, or are you reattaching to your, um, uh, getting the water right back out to the street, which I don't recommend, but you can certainly do that. What is swale? Oh, a swale. Um, we have some images of swales. A swale, yeah, a ditch. <laughs> sure, a ditch. Um, so if, if this is your ground plane, a swale is an area that is dug out, and, and a trapezoidal is, is what is uh, specified in, in city documents. But it's a way to convey the water above ground, not in a pipe. So here's an image of that, uh, the drawing, I guess, of that uh, dual tank system. So we've got the gutter here, and there's a leaf screen over the gutter. 
Then we come down and this is another a secondary backup leaf screen. You don't want any leaves in your tank. <laughs> um, that comes down along the house. In this case, the garage was actually lower than our piping, so our clean out is in here. That's unusual. But that it's actually the perfect height to get a wheelbarrow under there and you can clean out if you have a spot that needs that. This pipe comes under, up, and then into the tank itself. These are considered large debris screens. I like it as a secondary backup to uh, the other leaf screen. This is this, the leaf screen that I see around here. And one issue that they've been having with it is when leaves, any leaves are sitting on here, water bounces out a lot. I've been going with this. It just has a cover so the water can't bounce back out again. So the first flush. This is something that I've brought up several times but haven't really described. What you're doing is you're not capturing that first one gallon per 100 square feet of roof because the rain is nice and clean as it comes down around here. We don't have acid rain, luckily. But as soon as it hits your roof, now you've got dirty water. You could have bird poop, raccoon poop, um, <laughs> dead birds, insects. We don't know what is on our roof probably for better rather than worse. <laughs> uh, so we don't want to capture that and we want that to go somewhere else. This is what they typically sell as a first flush diverter. I have made my own that doesn't have a little ball in it. So when this, what happens is the water comes in off of the, the roof and say your system, okay this one says to tank on this side, your system's over here. So water flows in and then it has to fill in this pipe first before it can go off into your tank. Right? These are pretty snazzy um, with these little filters down here. Uh, the filter pops up into the inside and then this is where the water kind of just drips out slowly out here. So first rain comes in, the ball floats up to the top of the water and then it's slowly dripping down out here. So the ball comes down and down and down the next rainfall fills back up again. Okay? This is uh, one of the, the highest needs for maintenance. This is where gunk is going to go, so you're going to need to screw that bottom off and clean that gunk out, put it back in again. Um, I've done it where I just drilled it the teeniest, tiniest little hole up off the, the very bottom and let the water shoot off the side. Um, and this is how you size it. So when you're, if you're diverting one gallon for every 100 square feet of collection area, I did the calculations for you. Three feet of a three inch pipe is gonna hold just one gallon. Three feet of a four inch pipe holds two gallons. So that's just to help you size your piping. And this is what it looks like when you get it. So you, you buy this part. When the water fills up, then that's the dirty water and the clean water passes over. Yeah. And I know you can get these at the green store, right now anyway. If there's a sudden rush on them, they might get more, but right now they're saying these are slow, selling very slowly. Um, so I don't know if they'll get them all. So just, you want to have your clean outs throughout. Uh, these are all images of PVC. PVC is um, now known to be permeable for oils and chemicals and what have you, so um, they're now making HDPE pipes. I don't know how available they are. So if you want to get away from PVC, there is an alternative, but I don't know if they're carrying it locally yet. I just found out about this recently. Are you saying that PVC leaches or that it will collect contaminants? Uh, it's permeable to it. So if, if there's a spill nearby, it can come into your system. Yeah. So this is uh, the homeowner grade uh, turnoff. So when, when they're running in line, it's open. When it's perpendicular, it's closed. I prefer the commercial grade. They tend to be red. They're heavier duty. I like those because these tend to sit for years and years without needing to move. So 
you want it to be pretty heavy duty because there's going to be crud and gunk in there and you're going to need to be able to wrench on that thing to get it to move and you don't want those little tabs to break off. They're on the spendier side, the knot. So let's talk a little bit about money. Um, all the piping and such tends to cost around $150, $200, somewhere in there. Your tank, and therefore the foundation that's associated with it, that's really your, um, your big money hit and where there's huge variability, anywhere from $100 to thousands of dollars. Are you going to need to do excavation? What kind of soils do you have? Do you have really expansive soils? Therefore, you're going to need to have a deeper foundation. Or do you have lovely soils and it doesn't move and you can just put a little gravel, tamped gravel under your tank. So um, some images of differences. This is a concrete. This is above ground. So you didn't have to do excavation there. But you see it does have rebar in there, pretty tight knit of rebar. So you don't want that to crack. As soon as your concrete cracks, your tank moves, all the pipes that are running to it now are skewed and probably leaking. I've seen some beautiful systems that were put in that are just, it's just a skew, just a couple of inches, the whole thing leaks. And sometimes that's just so disheartening because you know you put so much money into it and now it's broken. I've seen people just let it be when really it's just a clean, easy fix. But, oh, I put so much money in and now it doesn't work. Ah! You know, it's like, oh, you can fix it. It's okay. Just go fix it. Uh, if you do gravel, you want to tamp that gravel. You want to use crushed gravel with minus in it. That means the little bits in it, so quarter, uh, three quarter minus. Um, in th three to four inch lifts, you want to come through and tamp it. And be, um, you can hand tamp it, but I prefer the, <laughs> yeah, most bodies prefer <laughs> to use the mechanical. Uh, tamping systems. Trickle fill and backflow preventer. So you have set up your lovely tank. You don't have quite a big enough tank to serve your garden's needs or indoor needs. And yet you have all your irrigation or you have it piped in to go into your house and you don't want to have to flip this switch and that switch and another switch. You can have your tank set up so that it refills from city water when, it, when your tank water reaches a certain low level. So refill that way. Two concerns there. One is the time that you're f filling that tank. You want to do it outside of the a.m. hours of like 5 to 7, anytime out, that's our high peak hours. And I might even extend that to 5 to 9, just to be safe. We, that is our high peak usage time here in Eugene. Every, the, most of the irrigation controllers come automatically set to go off at 6 a.m., I believe, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So everybody in town is irrigating <laughs> at that time, and they're maxing out Although we have plenty of water, there's only so much our system can be carrying at any one time. So changing your, your irrigation time, or certainly when you're filling your cistern, when you're f refilling your own cistern at an off-peak hour, you can be irrigating any time you want because you're not affecting that system. So I'm not going to get deep into pumps, just that you need one um, more often than not to feed a system. How big those that pump needs to be is very much reliant upon what type of system you have, how big is it, how much pressure does it need, um, and how often. So this is just a typical inline pump. Uh, it's usually hardwired. You can, they often have their own little pressure tank that fills from your main cistern. So um, most folks who do irrigation are very familiar with this type of system, especially if you're irrigating off of a well. This is a pretty common system. I like to go to places like uh, places that serve ranchers and people who really, really need to rely on their pumps, getting water for their cattle out in the middle of nowhere. And if their cattle die, there goes their livelihood. Those guys have good pumps. So uh, that's where I like to go for my pumps. My, my, my old favorite pump uh, that manufacturer was bought out. The pumps aren't any good anymore. So it's constantly changing. So that's why 
I just talk to the people, say at Coastal Farm Supply or something like that. They know their pumps. Oh, here's some pictures of swales. We're almost done here. So a swale um, can look like a dry stream bed in the landscape. Um, and this is help, this is could be for an overflow. And what that does is it really allows the water to seep down into the ground. Our typical systems with water coming off of the roofs and into pipes and off and wrap out, that leaves our whole landscape dry. There's, there's only, they're only getting water that lands on them to seep down. And all of our hardscape areas take away from that. So we can help uh, resaturate or get the water down where it can get cleaned and slowly, slowly out to our open waterways. This is a rain garden. In this case, they do want to put a cistern in, but that was secondary. They wanted their rain garden in first. The cistern will go back here at some point. So that's just another way to daylight your water. It's not a kind of shady there. I don't know language rain garden. What is that? Well, the some kind of similar to a pond. It won't. The water won't stand in here, though. Mm -hmm. So the water. This is a basically a 12 by 12 circle. Water comes in here. I've got lots and lots of plants in here, mostly wetland plants, drier plants on the sides, um, but plants that still like some water. And then a tree here to help shade this area as well. There's some, um, these are called check dams. There's a rows of rocks that come along so that the water needs to move slowly through this area. And then can't see it very well, but this is the overflow. So if the water gets all the way up to that level, then it will drain out. And mostly there's a lot of clay soils in this area, um, but she has never seen this overflow into that. Again, we've had some pretty good rains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ballpark cost for that project? I think it was 2000 and that, and that included having to dig up the old pipes back here and relay new pipes. Um, we had to uh, cut through this concrete in this case to put another pipe in because you always have to f have an overflow to an approved destination point, which means you're gutter in most cases. Unless yes. you can demonstrate that you're capturing 100% and capturing 100% of the, of the rain. But let's head outside and see some of these existing systems. You know, I, I, I question whether or not they actually had to pull water around from the other side. I think that they could have filled this tank, this looks like a 300 gallon tank, from this side entirely. So here's their first, the, if they have it open, so the water just falls down into their uh, leaf screen here. I'm not sure what they have going on on top of the gutter here. This is their uh, first flush. And it looks like they, they went and purchased oh, a, an official first flush. So when this fills up, then it comes over and into their tank. And that screens out all feces yeah. and this and that, more or less. Well, the feces is sitting in here. Right, that's yeah. what I'm saying, yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> right. Well, you can drain it on a regular basis. That's so right. You've got a little... And so it, this, this isn't sitting on a foundation, but it is using these piers. So that makes me a little nervous. I would want to have this water kicked away from the from the pier here. This <laughs> holding up the whole thing. So mm -hmm. this is a pretty I am not sure I feel comfortable with this foundation mm -hmm. here. That, that there's a lot of ways that this could be moving. Um, a way to, to do something like this that I would feel comfortable with would be to to dig out the area underneath it put a framework in the ground, fill that with tamped gravel, then you could tap it, top it with this. Would you actually need to do this in, in addition to the other? I don't know. But it is true that the higher that you have your tank, the smaller pump you need. So there's some trade-offs there. And so the overflow is behind the tank, actually. And then it comes over and fills up this tank. And I, I, then it looks like there, it overflows down into this rain garden that's over here. That's 
back over there. So it's piped away to that. And I think that the kids just enjoy pumping using this. I don't know that you really need to. And then they have their um, access port down there. So they're just using this for irrigation? Here. Yeah. And, and, and even more, I think, for fun and for hand washing. I meant to ask aside, how expensive does it get if you want to add UV filtration or any of the other filters? So um, to bring it indoors, I don't have hard numbers for you. And I think that the... Um, that that's going to be getting cheaper and cheaper that that they're just more expensive now because they're not in high demand mm -hmm. so i think that that's going to be changing the um s there's some bells and whistles that you can add to these systems i want to say that a uv system do i want to say it on camera um i don't know 500 to a thousand dollars you can have an extra uh like an alarm that goes off when your bulb burns out mm -hmm. so that you know it needs to be replaced. A UV light doesn't kill. What it does is it sterilizes the organisms that are in there so they can't multiply. Where's the electric pump? Um, this doesn't have one. They're just getting water from out, out of that little spigot there. Why would you need one? Because they're almost every six months in 2019. For irrigation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. If it's going really directly really to really irrigation. Yeah. yeah. You're right, in this if you're just getting water out of there, you can just open it right up. Um, one thing to note, and actually I would have it up a little bit higher even, is that the bottom of your tank is a sediment drop for anything that didn't get caught at our other systems. And there are definitely small particulates that could um, make it into your tank. And so having your outlet just a depends on how big your tank is, but I like at least a minimum of six inches. Um, where's the filter on this system? I mean, certainly there's the primary filter, I and mean, there's a uh, leaf filter up there, but where's the other filter? Uh, they have their first flush here. Oh, I see. In the back. They use a first flush instead of an actual <coughs> micron filter. Right, yeah, no, there's no micron filters, and there very rarely is on, in water that's to be used outdoors. Why, well, sure. Why would you? Yeah. Okay. The, the soil doesn't mind a few particulates. It's okay. The nature of soil. Right. <laughs> It loves particulates. Bring it on. That's how soil is built. So we can go look at the other system. Is, are there any other questions about this guy here? Let's go look at the bigger system that's up front here. To the cistern. It's gra there's no pump. It's all gravity. So then it, there's an underground pipe that uh, goes into this water feature, which I have never seen in practice, but um, bubbles up at the top and then across underneath the this concrete pad and then into uh, bioswell in the rain garden i don't think the water's ever gotten to the rain garden um <laughs> but the water is rainwater is used to irrigate the plants in this area now and the idea is to expand that irrigation as the system the bugs of the system like it's a drip system is it or it's a drip system yeah, yeah you can kind of i don't know if you can see it right now yeah the line right here oh, yeah the brown line for sure so go ahead all they did was paint it the same color as the house, <laughs> and it disappeared. Um, they have some gutter repair to do. I don't think water's getting in right now at all. <clears throat> but I, I'm sure that they're on it. <laughs> so this is a, you can't quite see it, but um, this is metal that's surrounding one of the HDPE tanks. Right? So there's a couple of pipes in here that you can't see. There's a small one that runs from here down to this um, valve that is then feeding the uh, drip irrigation, it looks like. And then this must be their overflow, which I think is what feeds into the, fount the fountain and then the, the rain garden. And I only know about the pump because one of my students is supposed to have wired it. And that's all I know. <laughs> But um, some people really like the look of the corrugated steel, and they want a corrugated steel tank and can't afford one, but with the additional rubber liner in there and, and all. Um, so this is one way um, to get that look without having the extreme cost. But this must, this says it's a 3,000 gallon tank. It's a tall, narrow tank. So just so you can visualize this is 
really pretty close to the tank itself, so that's about the size of a 6,000 gallon tank. And this side is trying to collect just, mm -hmm. this tank is trying to collect just this side here? Yep, and actually, with the downspout over there, I'm not quite sure, it might only be trying to collect half of the water. And does that seem like a reasonable ratio of tank to roof? Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, they, they would have still have overflow. Okay. Yeah. You you could you could multiply this. You could have several of these tanks in line and still only collect off a of half of the roof. For year round, using it year round. You'd expect so then, would you have enough water to irrigate this landscape throughout the year with multiple six thousand gallon tanks? These are, this is a low water use lawn, even though it looks like a pretty typical lawn. Um, the only plants that I see at first glance that are really thirsty here are um, those in the rain garden and there's a couple of blueberries in that um, garden over there. So you would have a pretty low use need here. And um, yeah, you probably could get, a, get away with like 12,000 gallons here. Yeah. With the combination of hardscape and open grass area, there's really plenty of space. Um, couldn't quite get a football game going on, but you could get some catch being played and you've got parks and fields nearby where an actual football game can happen. I think a lot of people think, I've got kids, I've got dogs, so I need to have huge lawn areas so they can play. Eugene has a fantastic park system that's where the lawns are and that's where you can play football and full-on soccer and here there's plenty of place to kick a ball, play catch, dog can run around and do its business. So just thinking about your landscapes in ways of rather than this will be lawn and I can pick, get in some nice little plants, like what do I actually need, what space do I need to have that I can occupy the ground space and then plant it up from there.